I would like to give you a brief introduction to the basics of uh, neutron scattering, how neutrons are used to study uh, magnetic materials and also materials in general and then I give you a few examples of uh, experiments that I have done using neutrons in this uh, brief talk. Okay. Just want to know how, so I am going to use the page down option here. So, I am uh, from the Department of Physics and Astronomy as uh, some of you know. Um, um, these days I have been uh, teaching a lot and I have less time for uh, research, um, but um, I hope to do more in the future too. Okay. So, the plan of uh, my talk is to give you um, some introduction like how, um, w what the properties of uh, neutrons that enable them to um, study materials and how neutrons are uh, generated and then the physics of uh, neutron scattering like how you can uh, study a magnet or a crystal or a nanomaterial um, by sending a beam of neutrons onto it and then what kind of information you can find um, about the material. And then the recent uh, developments in various types of instruments like you know neutrons can have uh, energy or it can have a momentum. You know, the beam can have um, beam can be generated let us say with at a reactor or at a pulsed um, spallation neutron source. So, the instruments and methods vary depending on what how the neutrons are produced and also depending on what type of information we are uh, looking for. Okay. There are uh, several methods and in a short talk it is not uh, possible to cover all of them. I try to give a general overview and then I tr then I will give you two examples. One is how small angle scattering of neutrons from nano composites can be uh, used to understand the structure of nano composite materials. And then I will also give some example of um, another type of scattering it is called inelastic uh, neutron scattering and especially if you have um, single crystals of magnets uh, this technique is uh, very helpful to understand how the energy is absorbed by the crystal and how um, so called the quantum mechanical state of um, atoms uh, changes okay. or some other type of excitations how the atoms can uh, vibrate and what kind of um, modes of um, energies that they can absorb when energy is sent uh, by neutrons into the crystal. So, those are the two things that I would like to focus and then I will try to give you a summary of uh, what is um, learned using um, these two examples and then try to give an outlook with um, new developments in the neutron scattering field what new physics um, you can uh, explore. And please feel free to stop me when something is not clear or you know if you have a question. So, let us start with the basic properties of a neutron. A neutron is a, a fundamental uh, particle that is um, residing inside a nucleus and it is neutral, it has no charge. As you can see, it's, um, it has a mass of um, 10 to the minus 27 uh, kilograms times 1.7. Uh, it is heavier than an electron, but it has no charge okay. and it has a spin half. A spin is related to angular uh, momentum. like it is like a top you know when it when a top is uh, spinning you know it, it has a spin angular momentum likewise neutron um, you can think of it as a kind of a top. Um, so, you can associate an angular momentum and although it is written as half you know it is half times some um, a fundamental constant which is the Planck's constant. Uh, so, further details can be learned um, by uh, uh, going into details uh, when one is interested. It also has uh, so called magnetic uh, dipole moment. So, it can interact with uh, magnetic materials. Okay. So, magnetic dipole moment is about two, bore, two nuclear magneton. It is a weak magnetic moment, but um, reasonably um, enough um, for any interaction between an electron and a neutron to take place and to measure that interaction. So, it is a particle and when it is uh, generated at uh, reactors or in um, spallation sources 
course, it is moving with some uh, speed or velocity. So, velocity, so it has also kinetic energy. And whenever um, you have a kinetic energy, you also have a momentum. So, wave vector is related to the momentum as you can see um, um, in the next equation. So, from energy, you can uh, energy E can be written as half mv squared and you can also write it as h k over 2 pi whole square divided by twice the mass of a neutron. So, the k is the wave vector, uh, it is an important parameter in the um, physics of neutron scattering. And you can also use um, some of the properties um, used in the development of quantum mechanics so called a wave particle dual behavior of matter. So, anything, any particle that is moving with some velocity um, can not only be treated as a particle, but also be treated as a, as a wave right? using the uh, relation of a de Broglie wavelength. So, if you divide the so called Planck's constant h with uh, the momentum of the particle, you can actually calculate a wavelength. Or in other words, the wave vector that you can calculate from the energy can be related to the wavelength, which is 2 pi over uh, lambda, right, is k. So, we can have uh, particle like properties like uh, velocity and kinetic energy and also we can have a wavelength uh, for a neutron depending, it, it depends on its uh, speed like how fast it is moving. And for the analysis of, um, for, the, for the experimental uh, applications. Um, especially for condensed matter systems, we would like to uh, classify the energies of uh, neutrons into three different uh, regimes. Neutrons with energies of uh, milli electron volts, milli is 10 to the minus 3 of an electron volt. Electron volt is one of the fundamental unit for, um, not, not fundamental, it is a unit for uh, energy. It is related to the joules, but it is like very, very small um, quantity of a joule, which is like 10 to the negative 19th of a joule. So, it is a very small energy. So, if the energies are in this range of 0.1 to 10 milli electron volts of the neutrons, then we call those as cold neutrons, low energy. And then if the energy of the neutron is 5 to 100 milli electron volts, those are called thermal neutrons. Okay. They have higher energy and as you can see the next regime is the hot neutrons which is 100 to 500 milli electron volts of um, energy. And next to that, you also have a temperature scale in Kelvin to give you an idea like you know, how, how hot uh, in terms of temperature, you know. Because energy, you know, in the previous uh, equation there can also be expressed as a constant called Boltzmann constant multiplied by temperature. So, the energy in milli EV can be converted into temperature. Uh, using that relation. So, you can get an estimate of um, what kind of temperatures, the energies we are talking about. Okay. And we also have this other relation that connects um, the energy to the wavelength. So, using that we can also calculate wavelength and it is given in the Nm which is nanometer, nano is 10 to the um, negative 9 power of uh, times a meter which is like 1. Uh, billionth of a meter, it is a very small uh, length scale. So, neutrons, cold neutrons have very short wavelengths, um, um, sh uh, short wavelength, actually longer wavelengths compared to the other energies because you know it goes as the inverse uh, of wavelength, energy goes as the inverse of the wavelength. So, cold neutrons have longer wavelengths and hot and thermal neutrons have uh, shorter and shorter wavelengths. So, in an experiment, uh, what we want to do is we want to pick a specific wavelength and, and do experiments um, on materials. So, that we know precisely the energy, um, momentum and wavelength of the neutrons that are sent and we can analyze how um, those energies change or the wavelengths change. So, those are the uh, basic properties and the um, equations that we make use of uh, to um, figure out what kind of neutrons uh, we need for experiments or um, and how to convert uh, their energy information into various uh, types of uh, uh, units. So, now let us look at uh, how neutrons are absorbed 
uh, by various materials. Right? So, when we are planning to do an experiment with uh, neutrons, we have to send a beam of neutrons onto the sample and there are two things that we want to uh, consider. One is how deep the neutron can penetrate into the materials. If the neutron can penetrate deeply into the materials, you can get information, the information of the uh, on the bulk of the material. If they can only penetrate like you know a few millimeters, a, a few micrometers, very very small distances, then you won't be able to study or sample the uh, entire volume of the uh, material that you are interested in. So, how deep they penetrate into the materials also is one factor. Then the other factor is how much of those um, neutrons are absorbed by the material itself. To be able to uh, extract any information in, on the material from using the neutrons, the neutron should actually exit the material. If the neutrons are absorbed by the material, then you do not have any signal, right? So, no, there is nothing that tells you what actually happened to the neutron other than uh, knowing that it is absorbed. So, we, we can only study those materials in which the neutron um, can penetrate deeply and the neutron is not uh, strongly absorbed. So, in this um, small plot, you have a nice comparison of how neutrons are absorbed by various materials and for a comparison, it is also uh, the plot also includes how um, x-rays are absorbed by materials and or how deep they can penetrate. As you can see, neutrons are um, at the top. So, that means they can penetrate much deeper compared to electrons and x-rays, which is a good thing. So, they can probe the entire volume of the sample. Um, in the case of uh, x-rays, you have a systematic trend. They can penetrate deeper and deeper into um, light low z materials and as the um, atomic number of the material increases, they can penetrate only um, very short distances um, inside the material. But for um, neutrons, there is no systematic trend as a function of the atomic number. There is kind of up and down uh, fluctuation um, for various atomic numbers. The only thing that we have to note is that for materials such as cobalt, cadmium and samarium, penetration depths are very low or the absorption is very high. So, when we do the experiments with such uh, materials and our samples with such materials, we are likely to lose a large portion of neutrons in the primary beam. So, um, the signal to noise ratio will be uh, much less. So, we do not want that to happen. So, so neutron is not a best probe for study materials such as samarium and uh, cadmium in particular. But one can isotopically enrich the materials and get rid of the isotope that actually absorbs the neutrons uh, significantly and um, still do the experiment. So, those can be done, but those are expensive, can be done only in special cases. But for um, other differences, um, like if you take a look at this uh, plot at the very beginning, like at the very lows. Hydrogen has um, can penetrate, um, neutrons can penetrate very deeply into the hydrogen, uh, but there also, there is also a strong difference between hydrogen and its isotope, deuterium. Hydrogen, deuterium and tritium, the absorptions are um, very different, right. So, very highest, intermediate and the lowest. So, you can take, let us say, a biological molecule and if you want to find out where the hydrogens are uh, located, you can. Um, um, let us say you can selectively uh, replace the hydrogens with the deuterium, let us say one segment of a biological molecule and study the scattering from it okay. and learn about um, its properties, its structural properties or if you have a compound system that has various types of atoms and you know that certain hydrogens are and some bonds and some other hydrogens are on a different types of bonds and you want to study as one of those then you can replace the hydrogen with the deuterium and this differences in scattering can help us um, get a um, contrast between the two types of hydrogens. And in terms of um, the physics, how neutrons interact, uh, there are mainly two types of interactions. One is neutron like a particle um, interacts with um, nuclei, like you know the atomic nucleus of uh, elements that are existing in the materials. So, this interaction takes place at only at very short distances because the new, it, this is a nuclear force. A nuclear force is 
strong, it is a strong force, but it is effective in only very short distances. As you can see, the range is only femtometer, femto is like 10 to the minus 15th of a meter. And that, that, so, so that interaction helps us uh, use the neutrons and find out where the nuclei are located in a material. Nuclei is a kind of an index for the position of a, an atom in a crystal. So, one can determine uh, where the atoms are located inside the material. So, the structural arrangement of um, atoms in materials. So, this is a primary tool uh, for such, such information. Every time a new material is synthesized or discovered, its structure should be um, figured out. Uh, so that one can understand the relation between the structural prop structure and other properties. In addition to neutrons, X-rays can also give that information. So, there are some advantages uh, for using neutrons. And then the other type of interaction is that they can uh, interact with the unpaired electrons um, with a dipole interaction. It is very much like you know if you place two magnets next to each other. So, you have a north dipole and a north dipole, they repel each other. Similarly, a south dipole and a north dipole attract each other, right. So, likewise, you can treat that a neutron as like a tiny magnet and then an electron like another tiny magnet. So, depending on you know how close it gets to, it can have a dipolar interaction and its scattering is uh, affected by that. So, you can learn about um, the electronic properties of uh, materials also. So, you can learn about the structure and electronic properties. So, we will go into some more details um, now into how um, neutrons are produced. There are two types of uh, neutron sources. One type is a research reactor, the other type is a spallation source. Um, this is the, the main difference between the two is the nuclear reaction. Um, So, a nuclear reactor is a kind of a simpler, simplified version of a reactor that is used for generating the power. For example, some of the light that we get, um, you know, some of the power that we use may be coming from nuclear reactors. Okay. So, those are the ones that generate just the power, but you can uh, design reactors for uh, research purposes also. And they make use of a um, nuclear reaction. So, like um, if um, uranium 236 92 breaks up uh, due to nuclear fission, heavy nuclei that have atomic number of uh, 92 or higher are uh, termed radioactive. So, what happens is um, because there are so many uh, protons they repel each other and the strong nuclear force um, which is only at shorter distances um, is not strong enough because the size of the nuclei increases. So, they repel each other and then the decay process takes place. So, it prefers to break up and become a smaller nucleus and become more stable. So, for that reason heavy nucleus such as uranium break up by spontaneous fission. So, no external involvement it breaks up on its own. And barium and krypton isotopes are generated, but interestingly together with that three neutrons are produced because this is like your chemistry reaction. On the left side, if you add up all the atomic uh, number of nucleons and if you add up the number of nucleons on the right, they should match. So, likewise, um, the number of protons. Similarly, number of protons plus neutrons also should add up on the left side and the right side. So, they should balance nicely. So, for that reason, uh, reason if you have a barium isotope 144 and a krypton 89 isotope, you have to have three neutrons also emitted in the reaction and then there is energy. This is the energy that is used to heat water and you know run turbines and generate uh, nuclear power. Okay, so, the 177 MeV goes into generating the power, but if you can collect these three neutrons, you can do research with those. So, that is what um, is done at nuclear reactors. Okay, so, but the thing is um, in a reactor, if you place a lot of uranium, it can undergo fusion. So, every reaction produces three neutrons. So, these three neutrons can break up another nucleus of uranium um, and then generate like nine neutrons. So, it can become a chain reaction. So, in at a reactor, they slow down the neutrons so that the probability of a secondary reaction is uh, reduced. So, they control the chain reaction 
uh, using moderators and produce only certain number of neutrons so that it, it is never um, it is kind of a um, state in which it is not in a chain reaction mode, but it is kind of subcritical so that it is um, it can be operated to produce certain number of neutrons without have causing a disaster. So, that is one type of source. The other type of source is called a spallation um, neutron source. So, in this um, you take a material such as uh, mercury. So, at spallation neutron source uh, in a lab national lab around here in Tennessee, they use a liquid metal mercury because um, it needs to be cooled and if you have a liquid metal it is you can circulate and you can cool it. So, you use that as a target and then um, you use a proton beam as a um, as an impinging beam, but use a very high energy beam like giga electron volts 2 giga electron volts proton beam is uh, impinged onto the target such as mercury or tantalum and then these heavy nuclei break up and then unlike the nuclear reaction this is like an induced reaction uh, unlike the other spontaneous fission. Um, this is an induced reaction. So, you can actually generate like 20 to 30 neutrons per impact. So, you get a beam with large number of neutrons that is what is needed for research. So, these types of uh, sources have become uh, more popular in uh, recent years and they have advantages too. Just to give an example um, the where I used to work uh, before coming here called Oak Ridge National Laboratory, they have a high flux uh, research reactor. It is one of the uh, highest flux research rea reactor in the United States. I think it was built in 1969 and it uses uh, uranium 235 and it uses a uh, water moderator and some other uh, beryllium reflectors and it has been used for uh, research. So, that is the location in Tennessee and some further details like you know you have um, the uranium fuel here and then you know the reaction uh, is fission reaction is controlled and you can generate neutrons uh, and then you can place instruments um, all around the um, reactor and then you have to monochromatize because the react a, a neutron produced in such a reaction will have various energies and various wavelengths. So, you use materials such as silicon uh, crystals and use um, reflection or, or so called a diffraction uh, property of crystals to select a specific wavelength. So, if you have a, a selected wavelength then you can use that to study um, um, structure and also um, excitations in materials. So, I, I skip some of those additional details and then give you the other example which is called the spallation neutron source. The, the Oak Ridge National Lab also have another source um, like, like the one I mentioned. So, it makes use of negatively charged uh, ions and those are accelerated with, a, with, a rea with a, an accelerator. It is not a circular accelerator, but a li like a linear accelerator and then um, there are various steps involved into it and then you generate proton pulses and then you bombard the mercury target with the pulses and then you can generate the uh, neutrons and then you slow down the neutrons uh, using water moderator and then you can send them to um, you can convert those neutrons into uh, neutrons of low energy which, which will become the cold neutrons and thermal neutrons. Cold and thermal neutrons can be used for experiments, hot neutrons are not suitable. Uh, So, once cold neutrons and thermal neutrons are generated, they can be um, sent to the instrument and the instrument is speci uh, specialized to measure certain uh, physical properties. So, this is the complete diagram. So, it is a huge facility with a lot of um, um, experimental activity. So, you have the linear accelerator and then you have um, the beam hall where the um, proton beam is uh, colliding with bombarding uh, mercury target and all the instruments are located here some other research buildings. And also um, not only at Oak Ridge National Lab, but um, just like within 30 minutes of drive from here uh, we have the NIST 
Center for Neutron Research in Gaithersburg, Maryland. They have a reactor source and they have also various types of instruments that make use of both thermal neutrons and cold neutrons. With thermal neutrons one can do um, structural studies and so also excitations. With cold neutrons you can study um, excitations and also um, study materials like um, biological systems and nanomaterials. Okay. So, cold neutrons have become more popular uh, for studying um, especially these uh, two systems nanomaterials and biological systems. But in experimental uh, condensed matter uh, physics research they also can use these cold neutrons to study nearly one dimensional or two dimensional arrangement of uh, magnetic systems, magnetic spins so called low dimensional uh, quantum systems or magnetic chains. So, these three uh, types of materials are uh, very popularly investigated with uh, neutron scattering. So, depending on um, the principle in the instrument, principle used in the instrument we can classify them into various types of instruments, uh, diffractometers where um, the wave vector that we talked in the beginning is its direction is changed, but it, its magnitude is not affected. So, so in a diffraction process you can um, reflect the neutrons, um, the neutrons are simply reflected by atomic planes in a crystal. So, in that there is an equation uh, called Bragg, Bragg equation or Bragg's law. If you know the wavelength of the neutrons and if you know at what angle the neutrons are diffracted you can find out the interatomic distances between the planes. And by doing the experiment at various angles of incidence you can determine the um, all possible interatomic distances in a solid. So, you can solve for its crystal structure. So, diffractometer is used for that. There is other type of instrument. So, in a diffractometer you have um, just a fixed wavelength for the incident neutrons and you just change only the direction at which they are incident on the sample and then also detect them at uh, as a function of angle. Other type is so called a triple axis instrument. So, you basically have three axes. The first axis is to change the energy or the wavelength of the neutrons. The second axis is to orient the sample or the crystal and then the third axis is to analyze the energy. So, you can send a beam of neutrons with known energy onto a sample. Sample absorbs some of the neutrons energy. So, the neutron the, that comes out of the sample has either gained energy or lost energy. So, you analyze that energy um, at the third axis. So, you know how much energy you sent into the crystal and how much energy the neutron has retained after it went through the sample. So, you can find out how much energy is lost or gained both processes can take place. So, you can do energy spectroscopy because crystals um, have excitations such as vibration of atoms called phonons or um, the rotation of uh, spins like a Mexican wave you know like you know when several atoms have spins and then when they rotate um, let us say in a cone with some kind of synchronization then you can generate a wave. So, those waves do not have continuous energy. So, like those are those energies are discrete you can figure out those uh, discrete energy levels um, of magnetic crystals. So, the excitations like you know given an energy to the crystal how it is going to absorb and what energy values the crystal is going to absorb is what one can figure out because it is not going to absorb all possible energies only certain discrete energies are absorbed because of some quantization like it can it can absorb only discrete values of energy. So, those can be studied and importantly by studying those properties you can actually find out what the system is like at the lowest temperature like you know, if you ever can cool the system to an absolute 0 how it is going to behave um, determines what kind of excitations it has when you give it uh, some energy or the temperature. Okay. So, you cannot actually go to the 0 temperature and find out how the material behaves, but you can actually measure the excitation spectrum like you know given energy what kind of energies it absorbs you can you can ba go back and calculate what kind of ground state it has. There is a there is a lot of interest uh, from the theoretical uh, point of view also to figure out the ground state ground state of a system. 
theoreticians can actually calculate um, using mathematics and some advanced uh, computational techniques, um, advanced theoretical computational techniques, um, what kind of uh, ground state the system has. And it will be, um, the techniques are very helpful to test those uh, predictions. So, the triple axis is for that and then the other type is called a reflectometer. So, you take, you place a, a thin film of a sample and you send the neutrons with almost grazing incidence and then they are reflected and when you do that neutrons not only go through the top layer because you know they can penetrate deeply, they can get reflected off multiple layers. So, if you have a lipid layer, if you have multiple layers and you can figure out um, the density of uh, matter. So, like the atomic distribution, like what kind of atoms are there and how densely they are packed in various layers. You can find out for those for the biological membranes and molecules. You can also determine um, magnetic, non-magnetic layer combination and you can also do that reflectometry um, with the magnetism analyzed and without, uh, without the analysis. So, when you do not um, use polarized neutrons like unpolarized neutrons are used, you can simply find out the location of atoms and you know how they are arranged like the density of atoms as, as you go deeper and deeper into the materials layer by layer. If you use polarized neutrons like you know neutrons with only a specific spin either spin up or spin down is used in one, one experiment and use the neutron with the other spin in the other experiment and see how, how they are different, how differently they are reflected by the material and you can find out information about how magnetic is each layer like you know let us say you take a hard disk drive you know it makes use of uh, layers such as iron, um, iron chromium, iron chromium like multi layers are used some other examples also exist. Each layer has a different magnetism depending on what type of atomic composition or chemical composition it has and it is important to understand also how smooth uh, the interfaces are. So, one can study the interfaces and magnetic properties of uh, layers using polarized uh, neutron re reflectometry and such instruments are also there at uh, NIST. And you can also use um, chopper spectrometer um, at um, reactor source you do not have a very good measure of the um, incident uh, neutron energy. So, what you do is you try to um, create a kind of a clock or you can um, have like you know like the jet airplane engine with multiple blades. So, the, the distance between the blades is such that if you spin this, um, this in jet engine like uh, structure only velocities uh, only neutrons with certain velocities can get through and it depends on the speed of the um, speed of this uh, structure called velocity selector. So, you can select the velocity by changing the speed of this um, uh, spinning jet engine like structure which is a um, which is called a velocity selector. So, you can get an estimate of uh, what energy of uh, neutrons are incident and then you can analyze the neutrons after they are scattered by the sample. So, that you can do uh, energy spectroscopy. So, that is what is technique and spin echo is a bit complicated. So, I skip that to save the time and the other type of technique is called small angle scattering. So, you send a beam of neutrons onto a sample and then um, the neutron is scattered by a very small angle like you know 4 degrees or 5 degrees at most. So, so uh, very small angle scattering of neutrons to do that you have to place a sample uh, in the neutron beam, but go very far away from the sample. If you are very far away from the sample you can detect a very uh, neutrons that are deflected by very small angles right. If if it is a very large angle deflection, you can put the detector right near the sample. But if you are looking for small angles, so the further you go away, the larger the separation is going to be between the primary beam and the scattered beam. So, you use um, very long um, detector um, systems like it is kind of a barrel. The detector um, is placed on a stage and then it is um, moved back and forth to adjust the angle required for the scattering. So, those are the types of instruments and uh, my expertise mainly in using uh, the inelastic scattering instruments and also small angle scattering instruments. So, 
at this point now that we learned a little bit about the instruments let us look at the scattering process like you know what are the various possible um, mechanisms for scattering so you have a neutron and the neutron is incident on a sample with uh, some of those energies that can be used for the experiments and then scattering process takes place and then there are two types of scattering one is scattering by nuclei and the other one is scattering by the electrons or the magnetic scattering and then you can also have out of these scatterings you can also have one coherent scattering and incoherent scattering coherent means it's like you know they are all in phase whereas incoherent scattering they are not in phase and again in each of these two types of scattering you can have an elastic scattering and an inelastic scattering elastic scattering means the wave uh, vector is simply uh, deflected so its direction changes but magnitude doesn't change in the case of inelastic scattering not only the direction but its magnitude is also changed so when the magnitude of the scattering vector changes its energy is affected so it either lost the energy or gained the energy so elastic um, sorry so elastic scattering um, can be used to determine the structure uh, elastic and inelastic scattering can be used to determine the structure um, excitations so this is the physics that you can do so equilibrium lattice structures we say this because you know you in, in any solid um, the temperature can actually make the atoms move so when we determine this crystal structure um, the atoms have to be in their equilibrium positions so that there is some kind of a coherent scattering between because when when they go out of their positions they may not be nicely arranged in a lattice okay but whenever like the short time that they spend in their uh, equilibrium positions you can get a coherent scattering or elastic scattering and then that can be used to figure out where the atoms are located and from the inelastic scattering as i said uh, you can get the magnetic excitations or vibrations and the incoherent scattering causes uh, both elastic and inelastic it contributes to the uh, background so you deduct this background like you know you do experiments um, with the sample or with the, with the blank and then you can take the difference you can also learn about uh, atomic diffusion using the inelastic scattering so that's another area of um, research uh, i don't do much of that so i skip that also so um, since neutrons can be treated as a wave you know they both have uh, both um, they have both amplitude and the phase so the concept of um, elastic scattering is like you know um, the wave the neutrons get scattered by you know it, it it bombards an atom and then it's kind of scattered by uh, that atom and then goes to the another atom and then so it 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 undergoes uh, multiple scattering process mm. so but in this pro in any of those scattering processes it does not change its magnitude but you can have other case where the uh, magnitude and direction both are changed so that becomes a inelastic scatter just a cartoon so what is small angle neutron scattering is it elastic or inelastic it is the coherent part of the scattering and it is the elastic scattering predominantly so depending on the sample if the samples have material such as hydrogen it can also have um, some incoherent scattering and it can have a small inelastic contribution also so it's not a pure um, elastic scattering but but for most of the materials we study are we selective in such a way that uh, the small angle scattering is dominant and then the other contributions are subtracted um, by choosing suitable samples so i skip this so then there is this uh, quantity called a uh, neutron scattering cross section so when a neutron is uh, let us say gets uh, scattered by an atom by a nuclei you can um, define a parameter b and if you use um, 4 pi uh, b squared like like some kind of a sphere like the effective sphere seen um, by the neutron so like okay so it's a little um, more uh, into the nuclear physics here so you can basically associate a number that measures the scattering power of a specific nuclei so these this b value depends on the type of nuclei like you know carbon 12 may have some b value and carbon 14 may have a different b value so these b these b values 
determine like how strongly they can scatter the neutrons. So, higher the B, higher the scattering. And also um, the nuclear and magnetic scattering that we talked about, those are the two mechanisms. How do we separate them? They take place at different k, va k values or different wave vector values. Yes, and you can uh, distinguish uh, the difference between the two types. So now um, the main advantage of small angle scattering is that you can study um, um, nanostructured uh, materials such as pores in um, some crystals or nanoparticles or some peptides or you know um, po polymers, a lot of materials uh, that have structures in the range of 1 to 100,000 nanometers. The principle of small angle scattering is like this, so you have an incident neutron beam of a specific wavelength and sample is placed in its path and it is scattered. So, so the incident uh, neutron wave vector is let us say K s okay, and then the you know, K i is the incident neutron vector and then uh, K s is the scattered vector and if you take the difference you can get the uh, wave vector Q. So, in an experiment you basically determine uh, the pattern on the detector like you know when a neutron is scattered and it hits the detector at various places around the central beam and by looking at the pattern you can learn uh, a lot of information. Um, the Q we call uh, the momentum uh, the wave vector is basically related to the angle, the higher the angle the larger the Q. So, the scattering uh, of neutrons is simply determined by uh, two factors, one is this factor F, the other one is the G. The F helps us figure out what kind of shape the scattering particles have, then the G helps us understand like how the structures are uh, located, like what is the interatomic distance between them and how densely they are located. So, if you have a fractal uh, system, a fractal is something that it replicates itself, like it, if you have a 3D mass fractal like the Romansko broccoli, you know it has the same structure but it is replicated in all directions. So then you can get power loss in the intensity of neutron scattering as a function of the um, scattering vector. So, you can um, fit those power loss and figure out what kind of fractals are existing in the system. Okay. So, we studied a sample called uh, magnesium oxide uh, with doped with nickel thin films um, grown on strontium titanate. So, these um, films were uh, grown by laser ablation. So, you can see that magnesium oxide um, grows like rods and then there is a network of rods, so three dimensional networks, but they are, predom they are mainly in two directions like the 1 0 0 direction and 0 1 0 0 direction on the substrate. So, we did small angle neutron scattering on this sample and it also has 9 percent of nickel and nickel forms the spherical nanoparticles. And the growth modes are like this, so like you know initially you have a rod of uh, magnesium oxide and then you have a droplet of nickel and then that continues, so you have the rod like networks of uh, magnesium oxide and also nanoparticles in between. These two combined you know produce an interesting scattering pattern in the sense. Usually you get a spherically symmetric pattern like a circle or you know some kind of asymmetric pattern like an ellipse but having this eight fold pattern is um, very surprising and we spent like last uh, several months to understand this uh, data. First we fitted the scattering intensity with the power loss and got these exponents. So, the exponent 3 negative 3 indicates that there are 3D mass fractals of these um, nano rods and then the exponent of neg sorry the exponent of negative 4 indicates that you have like smooth surfaces again of the nano rods and then the exponent 1.5 indicates that you have one dimensional um, structures with projections. So, that is how the nano rods and uh, nickel nanoparticles are connected in the system. In addition the intensity of these peaks um, can also be analyzed. So, if you actually look at this these peaks are nicely separated by 45 degrees because it is 8 fold symmetry. Uh, we fitted this with 8 Gaussian peaks 
and that is how the fit looks like. So, as you can see the solid, solid curve is the fitted one and then the dots are the experimental data. So, so these are the peaks that are approximately separated by 45 degrees and um, those are the intensities. Interestingly there is a relation like you know the highest one is in the 90 uh, 270 degree direction and then the next combination of pairs is one half of that and the next combination is only 40 percent of the highest and then the other 180 360 pair is only one third of the highest. So, interesting relations are there and we interpret this like this. So, the rods are predominantly in the vertical and the horizontal direction. So, they give four of those spots, but the nickel dots can be connected either in the vertical, horizontal or also in the diagonal directions. So, the nickel contributes to all the eight peaks. So, that is why their intensities are also not the same. Okay. So, it is time up I think. So, I would like to stop around here I think.